Somebody say this is a journey. We're, a, we're on a journey. You know, after you become a Christian, after you're saved from sin, you begin a journey. It's just not twiddle your thumbs till Jesus comes. You know, we're on a journey. God's doing something in our lives. How many are believing God is giving you control over your own spirit? Huh? Like we've been preaching about, getting victory in your own life. The world needs to see light. And Jesus, he said, I'm the light of the world. But then he said to his disciples, you're the light of the world. And there needs to be something in us that they can see that says there's a better life. Praise God. And we're on a journey. And I'm going to take you through this. And just mention last week, remember we talked about John the Baptist, the law and the prophets were until John. Once John the Baptist came, after that, what was preached? Do you remember? After John comes, the kingdom is preached. And what was the body of water that they crossed finally after they left the wilderness and went on into the promised land? No, that was, a, that was the first one when they came out of Egypt. I'm glad you mentioned that, because when they came out of Egypt, they crossed the Red Sea. But then when they went 40 years through wilderness and came out of the wilderness, the exact same thing happened all over again. It wasn't the Red Sea this time, but the water opened up. And what was the water? Jordan. And that exodus was a journey. They came out of Egypt, they journeyed with Moses, got the Ten Commandments, they got all of this tabernacle furniture, you, the Ark of the Covenant was made at that point, and it brought them to the land of Canaan, to the Promised Land. And just as they crossed the Jordan and were now entering into that Promised Land, John the Baptist was baptizing in that same river, the Jordan. And then he introduced Jesus to the world. And he said, I didn't know who the Messiah was, but God spoke to me that through baptism I would see the Messiah. The Spirit would come upon him like a dove. And then when he saw Jesus, not everybody saw this, but when he baptized Jesus, he saw the Spirit come down like a dove. It was God's sign, and, and he said, this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He said, I didn't know it was until that moment. And, and then it, Jesus started preaching the kingdom. So just like they got out of the wilderness when they crossed Jordan and went into the kingdom land, John the Baptist in the Jordan River opened up the kingdom land to us when Jesus Christ came on the scene. Aren't you glad for newness of life in the new covenant? Amen. But I want you to go with me to Hebrews chapter 3. I'm going to show you how this is a journey. Again, somebody say this is a journey. Hebrews 3 and 6 says, But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house are we? Now, isn't that interesting that he didn't talk about a church building somewhere and said, that's Jesus' house? Everybody said, we are the house. We're the house. You know, the word church doesn't mean a building really in the Bible. That's been kind of distorted over the years. The word church is the people. Hello, church. Hi, people. You're, you're the house of God. But it says we are his house if. Now, how many know that little two-letter word packs a wallop? <laughs> if. <laughs> we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope. Everybody say the hope. Firm unto the end. So here we have an introduction that this is a journey. We've got a hope that we need to hold on to. Because we're going to be the house of Christ in this world if we hold on to this confidence and this rejoicing. Clear all the way to the end. Unfortunately, through my years as a Christian and as a pastor especially, I've seen people quit the journey. They didn't hold on to that confidence firm to the end. Their confidence became weak. Their, their, their rejoicing became weakened. And they lost that hope. They couldn't hold on to it anymore. And they never made it to the end. I pray God brings them back. But they stopped serving Jesus. And so I want to make it all the way in this journey. How many want to make it through to the end? Amen. So that little word, if, and, and notice, everybody say hope. Hope. 
I want to focus on that. Now, it's speaking of journey. Then in verse 7, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost says, now by the way, let me explain that. Whenever you read in the New Testament, as the Holy Ghost says, or saith, he's going to refer to the Old Testament somewhere. Because how many believe holy men of God wrote that Old Testament as they were moved on by the Holy Spirit? So although Isaiah wrote what we just heard and that saw in that video, and although Moses wrote Genesis, the Holy Spirit is the real author. It was what was speaking through them. It's like he's the boss, and Moses and David and all those guys that wrote the Old Testament were the secretaries, just taking down his words. So as the Holy Ghost says, and now he quotes the Old Testament, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Now, what's the root word of provocation? Provoke. How many know what it is to provoke somebody? <laughs> How many have been provoked? <laughs> well, God's speaking of the days of provocation. There was a provoking happen that happened, and it said it was in the day of temptation in the wilderness. So here, after he tells us, we've got to hold on to our hope clear unto the end, and he makes it out to be like a journey, then he talks about the Israelites' journey in the wilderness. Say this with me. The Exodus journey is the greatest picture of the Christian journey. It's one of the most perfect pictures. Have, have you ever saw that movie, The Ten Commandments? You see the movie? Charlton Heston, didn't he have that cool beard when he saw the glory of God after that? <laughs> and saw the glory and the, the finger of God writing the Ten That was in the Exodus, and he was bringing them. And then, by the way, when they came to the Jordan, Moses stepped away, Joshua took over and took them in. And Joshua is the Hebrew form of the name Jesus. Joshua represented Jesus, how he brought them in. But anyhow, he uses that Exodus journey when they were tempting God, when they actually provoked God because their hearts became hard. How many know there are two things that the Bible speaks about that your heart accomplishes? Does anybody know what they are? Well, this is not your blood pumper. Pumps blood through arteries. No, that's not the heart I'm talking about. What does the Bible speak of the heart? What does it do according to the Word of God? Two things. Love. How many know you can love with your heart? See, when it's from your heart, you're loving. Well, does anybody know the second thing your heart does in the Bible? You can't hate. In fact, that's when your heart gets hard. Like it's saying, don't harden your hearts. Everybody say, believes. We can believe, too. And their hearts became hardened when they were tempted. We go through temptations, all of us. And that's why I mentioned some people stop walking this journey. They quit. They don't have the hope anymore. What happened? Temptation attacked them, just like it'll attack all of us. It attacks me. How many have temptations still attack you? After all these years, it's, it never stops. It's relentless. The writer of Ecclesiastes says there's no discharge in this warfare. <laughs> Where there's always a battle. And that tempted them and tempted them until it affected them. And this is what we can't let happen. We've got to continue to hold on to our hope no matter what we see and, and not get tempted to provoke God and, and upset what his, his will is trying to be. They, they provoked, they hardened their hearts in their journey. Somebody say their journey. So they were physically walking through a wilderness to get to the promised land. Now, we're not physically walking through a wilderness we're not physically walking anywhere in our journey. Our journey is a spiritual one where we're going through hardships, everyday struggles in life. Leona told us her son's in the hospital now. Might have had a heart attack. Can you imagine a mother, what she's thinking about this right now? She told me she's been weeping on the way to church and singing on the way to church and praying. And, and that's why I said, sister, we're going to storm heaven and believe God to heal him. How many believe God's going to, is already touching him right now? Well, that's, that's a hardship. And, and it's hard to hold on to your hope when you go through those hardships. It's tempting to lose your confidence, especially your rejoicing. But he said, you're on a journey. Hold on. Hold on. I remember hearing Jesse K. 
can't remember his last name now, a black gospel singer way back in the 80s. His whole song was called Hold On. And, and every few lines, he'd just say, hold on a little while longer, just hold on a little while, longer, just hold on. And, and I'm sure he was thinking of this verse. Hold on to your confidence. When you go through storms, God will bring you through. How many are glad we got God on our side to bring us through hard times? I've had times where I felt like Paul and Silas. Remember Paul and Silas were in jail and we sang that song, God's a chain breaker? Well, they were in chains, they were shackled, but the Bible said instead of complaining, instead of saying, oh, look what we ha happened to us, Silas, this is great. What kind of payment is this, working for God, and we get ended up in jail and shackles? They didn't do that, which some people would. They just started rejoicing and praising God in the middle of it all. And then the Bible says the prison shook, the chains fell off their arms. And you might not be in physical chains this morning, but you might feel some kind of bondage trying to hold you back. But like them, don't complain. Just say, God is with me. God is with me. I'm not going to praise God for everything, but I'm going to praise God in everything. I'm going to hold on through the hard times and give him praise. And you know what will happen? Like the chains physically fell off those men, they'll spiritually fall off of you. It won't hold you back anymore. God sees your faith and he blesses you and you can have peace in the midst of a storm. Let's thank God for that right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And so don't harden your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Now, if he said, we've got to hold on to the end, hold our confidence to the end, and then says, instead, don't harden your hearts, then obviously harden your heart is losing your confidence, right? So when you lose your confidence, your heart is getting hard. But have faith. Keep your heart soft. And what it is, is it's soft toward God. But when it becomes hard toward God, that means you don't believe him anymore. That means you don't rejoice in what he's done for you anymore. And that's what it means to have a hard heart. You lose faith. You're not assured by faith anymore. And then he compares, and then he goes into the Exodus. Somebody say their journey. Look at your verse 9. When he says your fathers, he was talking about, remember your ancestors, you Jews? They tempted me, they proved me, which means they tested me. They saw my works 40 years. How many remember the miracles God gave them? The works that they saw was astounding. They got up every morning and there was manna in the fields. Food in the middle of the wilderness where there's no grocery stores, no markets, no butchers. Food was there every morning. They, they saw a pillar of fire lead them through the wilderness. They saw Moses when he came down with the glory of God. His face was so bright, they had to say, veil your face. And then they saw in Egypt, they saw the hail turn to fire. They saw a uh, darkness that, so thick you could feel it. They saw the rivers turn to blood. In fact, to this day, you can go and there's archaeological evidence of some kind of disasters happening in Egypt where they had to get the slaves out of there. And that's the Bible story of the Exodus. And... They saw his works for 40 years, but they were so provoked. They were provoking God. They tempted him. Wherefore, he said, I was grieved with that generation and said, they always are erring in their hearts and they have not known my ways. So God says, I swore in my wrath, they will not enter. Everybody say it with me. They shall not enter. Say it again. They shall not enter. There's a journey. They were on a journey to go to Canaan. And after 40 years, they came, and, and God says, that's it. They're dying off now. I'm not going to let them in my rest. And you, let me pause for a moment. Remember that what it was? It was just a couple short years after they got out of Egypt that God brought them right to the promised land. To think that they could have been in there 38 years earlier than what they were, because Moses said, okay, every one of you, all the 12 tribes, Issachar, Zebulun, Naphtali, all you get one amongst your tribe, we're going to send some spies in. God's going to show you how beautiful the land is. Everybody stay on this side of the Jordan. Let's wait for them. They were gone for 40 days. And everybody's anticipating, what did they see? What did they see? They come back. And they said, Moses, and the crowd, can you imagine the crowd? 
We're going in the promised land. They're just going to tell us what it's like. The land surely flows with milk and honey. Look at the grapes that we brought. And they had two men carry huge grapes on a pole. And that's the grapes of Ashkal. They were just renowned for big fruit. But they also saw big giants. They said, but there's walls. I don't think we can break through. There's people that were like grasshoppers. There's giants in there. And now it didn't mean like 30-foot giants and mythical creatures like that. It just meant there was some people in there. They called them the sons of Anak. They were like eight, nine feet tall. There was a group of people in that land at that time. Goliath descended from them. And, and they said, we can't make it. We can't go in. Yes, the blessings are there, just like God told Moses, just like Moses said, but we can't go in there. But what's Joshua and Caleb do? What do you mean we can't go in there? We've got a God. Did you see what God did to Pharaoh and took us out of there when he said, you're not going out? Moses, you told him, let my people go, and God made him let us go. What do you mean we're not going in? We are able to go up and take the country and possess the land from Jordan to the sea. God's with us. But that was only two of the ten spies, Joshua and Caleb, the, t the twelve rather, the ten that doubted their word prevailed, and that spread through that people like a disease, and they all were doubting, the whole nation was doubting God. And God says, okay, every day you've been in there, 40 years searching out that land, I'm turning it into a year. 40 years you're going to be out here until every last one of you are dead. I'm going to spare Joshua and Caleb because of their faith. But y'all are going to die, and your kids are going to go in and take the land instead of you and so it two years turned into 40 and that's what God was talking about when he said they always err in their hearts they saw what I did they saw the miracles and they still couldn't believe so I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest after he says that after he goes back 1500 years he comes up to their day and talks to the church the Christians Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you, like them, an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Somebody say entrance. How many want to finish this journey and enter? The Bible talks a lot about it, doesn't it? Knock on the door. There's going to be some that are going to knock on the doors closed. It's going to be too late. You can't enter. You had unbelief. I want to hold on to my confidence. What's the opposite of confidence? Unbelief. There you go. So verse 6 mentions confidence again. Now, look at this. Hebrews 3 and 14. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Doesn't that sound like the verse we started out with in verse 6? Let me go back a bit. Christ is a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of hope firm unto the end. It's like he repeats it in verse 14. We are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence. So somebody say we're going to be the house of Christ if we hold on to our confidence. Now say we're partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of the confidence. So these are the two things he's trying to get us to focus on. You're going to be the house of Christ in this world. You're going to be a partaker of Christ. And there's that little two-letter word again. Somebody say it. If you hold the beginning of your confidence. So somehow, them entering into that land, which the doubters, God said, you're not getting in. You've doubted me, I'm not letting you in. Somehow entering into that land represents us partaking of Christ. It represents us being Christ's house. If we hold on to our confidence and not be like those hard-hearted Israelites that doubted God, we're going to partake of Christ. Now, how many believe that you're saved and you, when you get saved, you, you partake of Christ to a degree? Well, that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about people that are already saved. And he's telling them, they're already saved. God already blessed them. You will be a partaker of Christ if you hold on to the confidence right through to the end. Obviously, whatever he means by being a partaker of Christ is so awesome, the average Christian doesn't even have it yet. I made my mind up when I got a hold of God, and I got on fire for God. How many know what I mean by getting on fire for God? You're going to be a serious Christian. 
You're not just going to church Sundays and that's it. You're going to live for God every day. You're going to live for God at work. You're going to live for God at home. You're going to live for God out in the street. You know God is your God and it's a 24-7 deal, folks. When you become that serious with God, you are going to be a partaker of Christ that whatever he's talking about, I'm in. I want it. I want to get a hold of these blessings of Christ. They could have been partakers of the milk and of the honey. They could have been partakers of that precious promised land. And instead of being slaves in Egypt, they're kings on their own land. And that somehow represents being a partaker of Christ. Somebody say, that's kingdom. So it's no wonder John the Baptist was the end of the law, and from that point on, the kingdom was preached. Kingdom, kingdom becoming a partaker of Christ means you have victory in your life. You are now the house of Christ. God is proud to call you his house. You are my people. You have held on to me through the thick and through the thin. You've held on to me through better or for worse. You held on to me when storms happened. You didn't let go. You didn't harden your hearts like they did in the Exodus. You held on, and I'm proud to call you my people. How many want to be in that group? Praise God. Remember Jesus said, you be ashamed of me. And I'll be ashamed of you in front of my father and all his angels. And so, folks, you be proud of Jesus. When the world starts criticizing God, Christianity, and the church, you stand up. And if you're just a two of out of 12 or one out of a thousand, you stand up anyway and say, I'm a Christian. I stand for Christ. I disagree with what you think of the church of the living God. And... The, most of the reason people look at the church and laugh today in 2017 is because of the fakeness and the counterfeit going on. Because they've seen too many people walk through a church door and act like the devil when they get out. But when you're true blue and they know it and you are proud to hold on and say you are a Christian in a world where Christianity is mocked, God looks at you and you are a partaker of Christ. You are the house of Christ. You are going in the promised land. Hallelujah. How many want to hold on to your confidence? How many want to hold on to your rejoicing? Let's keep reading. Verse 15. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. He's quoting that again. We read that too a few verses ago. Harden not your hearts is in the provocation. For some, when they heard, say Israel in the wilderness, when they heard, they provoked God. How be it, not all of them that came out of Egypt by Moses. Who were the two that didn't complain? Joshua and Caleb. So not all of them did. But he said most of them did. They, when they heard the word, what was? does anybody know what their word from God was? Our word is to hold on firm until the end so that we are Christ's house and we partake of Christ. Their word was hold on until you get into the promised land. And that's the very thing they didn't do. Right? I'm not going to give up. You guys do what you want. I'm not giving up. How many are with me? I'm not giving up. I'm holding on. I've been through the storm. I've been through the smoke and the fire and the flood. And I'm still holding on after all these years. And if he could take me through that, he can take me through whatever's coming up. Praise God. But when they heard, they provoked. Not all that came out of Egypt. But with whom was he grieved for 40 years? Was it not with them that sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they should not enter into his rest? Say, enter rest. Enter rest. There's a journey here. Praise God. But to them that believed not. So we see that they could not enter in Canaan because of unbelief. It's by the same token, chapter 4 says in verse 1, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Because unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. They had a different kind of gospel than what we got. Their good news, their gospel, which is what good news means, is you're going into the promised land. Our gospel is we're going to heaven one day, praise God. Not only that, we, we're, we're going to have a place in this life where we're partakers of Christ, where we, if we have a need, if we have a mountain we're facing, if we have a loved one that's sick in the hospital like Leona's going through right now, that she can have faith and hold on and see God heal that man. Praise God. That 
Coralie can be healed and, and no complications. And Sarah can be touched by God. We pray until something happens. We push. We push. There's resistance when you have to push something. And all of this temptation can be so much of a, a battle, a resistance to us. But we hold on anyway. And I'm not going to doubt God if I've never believed God before. I'm believing him now. I am going to pray until I get my answer. If God could heal some person, he could heal me. He could heal my loved one. If God ever did a miracle for you, he could do it for me. And right now, I need a miracle. So I'm praying and I'm going to cast out every doubt out of my mind. If it takes me two hours of prayer to do it before all the doubts gone and finally something happens in me where it clicks and I know God's going to answer me like he did for my prayer many, many times when I saw miracles happen. I'm going to see it happen again right now because I've got a journey I'm going through. And church, what I want you to do here today is take these mountains take this temptation take the the resistance that they they met when they wanted to go into canaan and apply that to any problem you go through now apply that leona has to apply it right now for her son elfie has got to apply it for his wife jonathan your mother-in-law you guys need to apply it. And, and i don't know what situations you have but whatever it is if you take what i'm preaching and you believe God through it, you will break through, you will partake of Christ. You know what it means to partake of Christ? Let's again use Randy as an example. If we partake of Christ for his healing, that boy's going to be healed. And it's going to take breaking through the doubt, breaking through the unbelief. How many have seen God work in the past? You see, how many have seen miracles happen? And just like Israel, they saw miracles happen. But just because you saw them happen in the past doesn't mean you're guaranteed you're going to always see them. You have a part to play now. You've got to hold on your confidence if you're going to see another miracle. The reason you saw a miracle years ago is because you held on to confidence back then. You had a certain confidence. Well, you can lose that confidence. So always keep your confidence fresh. Always keep your faith current today. And that's why God says today. After such a long time, today, if you will hear his voice, if you'll hear the word of God that I'm giving to you right now, don't harden your hearts. This week, something might happen to us that we're not expecting. It, it'll take us broadside without us even knowing it, it was coming. It could happen. I don't know what might happen this week. But God's given me a word today. And he's spoken to me today. And if I apply it, and if I believe, if I walk out of this church this morning, out of this service, Man, I'm holding on. I'm believing what he was talking about. I'm not going to be like those doubting Israel. I'm going to be like the minority, Joshua and Caleb. Then when it comes this week, you're ready. It might broadside you, but you're already braced because you've learned the word of God today. Let's thank God that he tells us things that prepares us for whatever we're going to go through. Praise God. But the word preached to them didn't profit them because it wasn't mixed with faith. You see, you could hear me preach right now. And if you're mixing it with faith, I'm eating this. I'm swallowing this. I'm How many know when you swallow something, you're going to digest it? It's going to become part of your body. You ever hear that saying, where he leads, I'll follow? Well, what about what he feeds, I'll swallow? I'm giving you bread of life here this morning. Are you swallowing this stuff? Or it just tastes good. Mm, I'll spit it out after because I just like the taste. No, swallow this. Make it just like food that you swallow becomes part of your body. Word of God that you swallow becomes part of your faith. I believe it. I'm applying that to my life. Yeah, I know God could do it for you. He could do it for everybody. But I'm just tasting it if I think like that and then spitting it out again afterwards. Like it's just cheap chewing tobacco. But I'm swallowing this. I'm eating this. Praise God. This is bread of life. This is food for my soul. This stuff is going to make me strong in the spirit. How many know you eat certain kind of food? It'll build up strength. You eat other kind of food, it'll build up fat. <laughs> well, I want to get some meat inside of me. I want to get some food from the Word of God so that I'm strong by the time a trial comes up, by the time another storm hits my life. I want to have that kind of peace in the middle of a storm that we sing about. But it, 
needs to go beyond just a, a song Sunday mornings. It needs to be a lifestyle. So I'm biting into this and I'm swallowing it. Hallelujah, God. Because that word that they preach, they never mixed it with faith. When you hear the word, it's, you've got a responsibility. Okay, I'm going to make an effort and believe this. I'm going to believe this. I'm going to make this. When I go through something this week, I don't know what's coming. And some of you might know what is coming. And you're bracing yourself already. Well, here's going to be some extra strength for you now. You're going to have something this morning you didn't have otherwise. You mix it with faith. Because we which have believed do enter into rest. Who was it that couldn't enter into his rest? Them that believe not. Well, on the other hand, we which believe, we do enter. Joshua and Caleb did enter. The other doubters, they didn't. Somebody say, this applies to everyday life. Can you see how it applies to everyday life? I mean, if all I talk to you about heaven one day, which hasn't even happened yet, what's that going to benefit you for right now? If all I talk about is where God brought you from, you used to be this, you used to be an alcoholic, but you're not now. Praise God for that and praise God for heaven. But folks, between the getting out of the world and getting to heaven, there's a life I've got to live right now. I've got to have victory over the hard things I go through. And thank God there's a lot of word for that. Why do you think the Bible's that thick? Why do you think there's 66 different books in that Bible? One of them's got 150 chapters. Because it's talking about a lot of stuff we can do right now. Hallelujah. And that's get a hold. Look at all those lessons of that exodus. See how their journey is like a shadow of our journey. And just like they held on and some doubted and fell away, we can hold on. Though some might doubt and fall away. Somebody say, I'm going to mix the word with faith. For we which have believed do enter in. As he said, as I've sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Everybody say rest. Enter the rest. You might say, okay, now there's another. Number one, we're going to be the house of Christ if we hold on. Then he told us you're going to be partakers of Christ if you hold on. Now he's saying if you hold on, you're going to enter into our rest. And this, this third one is the one I love more than any of them. A rest. What's he mean? We'll enter a rest. I'll tell you exactly what he means. When you mix this word I'm preaching to you right now with faith, which Israel, if they had only done that with Moses' word, they wouldn't have died off like they did. You come into a place of such confidence that you're holding on to your confidence, firm to the end, you're holding on to your... You enter a rest. Paul said it like this. I don't care what state I'm in. I'm content. I don't care if everything's going nicely, which is easy to be content in, or if it's a cyclone around me of circumstances in life. I'm still content. How can you have such peace in the middle of that kind of storm, man of God? I'll tell you how he'd tell you. I learned. I'm instructed. I have learned that whenever state I'm in, they're in to be content. I've learned that it doesn't matter. God's on my side. Yes, but it's bombarding our minds. Look, these giants and walls like they were afraid of. Well, I've got different giants and I've got different walls, but they're making me afraid just as they were. How do you take that? There's a God. There's a God. I've taught from the word of God. I've been taught. Remember God's with you. Remember God's with you. You know, we're going to have coat racks here for your coats. We're going to have places to put your hats, but we're never going to have somewhere to check your brains in when you come to church. <laughs> You're going to have to think about what the Word says. One man started a whole ministry. You ever hear of Ravi Shach Zacharias? He started a whole ministry. Let my people think. Like Moses, let my people go. Let my people think. Christians need to think about this word, and that's when you mix it with faith. You hear what I'm saying. You hear, they doubted and they blew it. They didn't hold on. Well, I'm on a journey just like them, and I can't doubt either. I might not be going out of a physical desert of dust and cactus into a nice promised land of milk and honey, but God's taking me out of a place of frustration and worry and, and impatience into a place of confidence and rejoicing. And I'm going to learn how I can be content in whatever state I'm in. What I'm preaching to you this morning, if you mix it with faith, you're going to get to the place where 
you're going to know God's with you. You don't have to worry. Yeah, but this is not God's with me. I don't have to worry. Well, what's he going to do? I don't have to know what he's going to do. I don't need to understand. What's the rest of that chorus go? I just need to hold his hand. You don't know. You see, we're so used to being in the driver's seat. You ever, you ever teach your kid how to drive? Yeah. Oh, boy, how many know it's nervous to sit in the passenger seat where your kid usually sits, and now they're in the driver's seat? Oh, man, that's scary. And it's, it's just like that with us. We've been in the driver's seat of life so long that we're scared out of our wits to sit in the passenger seat and let God drive. But he's a million times better driver than we ever could be. Hallelujah. We don't know what's coming around the corner, but God does. So let God take care of your future. You're going to be content if you learn how to do that. Well, how do you do that? Here's how you do it. You think. Keep your brain in your skull. Okay. God knows the future. I don't. He knows what's around the corner next week. I don't. So if I let him take control of me right now and let him handle it, take it off my shoulders, let him really drive. How many know you've got to give him the steering wheel in life? He's just not going to take it on you. He's a, not, he's a gentleman. He won't force himself on you. But he says, let me drive. Follow me. I'll lead. It's your choice right there whether you're going to, okay, you take it, you take it. You know when we're driving, here's what we do. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? I've got to think of something to do if something ever happens. If this happens next week, I've got to be ready for it. What can I do? You're driving. You've got to let God drive. God Take my burdens. Take my worries right now. And when you keep that in your mind, after I prayed, when I had that miracle happen to me later, and I had no money and a miracle came, after I prayed, between my prayer and between the miracle, I had to fight unbelief like you wouldn't believe. I had kids to feed, folks. I had a wife to feed. I had a family to take care of. And I had one last check. I'm telling you, it was a battle to fight unbelief after I gave that prayer. Because Jesus said, if you doubt nothing after you pray, I'll give you the miracle. Oh, no. I thought we just had to pray. Now we can't doubt? That's exactly right. You can't doubt now. Anyone can pray. But how many are going to say, I'm going to believe now that I prayed? And when you believe, these battles fight your mind? And no, no, I'm casting that out. I'm taking control over my spirit with Jesus Christ. God is going to make a way. Yeah, but what are your family? What about the plates? You see those? This stuff went through my mind. You see those plates in the cupboard? Are you going to have any food in there in a couple of months? Not the way it looks. And this is where you remember the scripture. We walk not by sight. I don't go by what it looks like. I go by faith. I believe God will answer me. I can't see it, but I believe it. How many know when you can't see it, you still believe it? That's faith. Might not be scientific evidence, but faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I believe. Hallelujah. That's why scientists will never believe. So, there's some that are believers. Aren't you glad for those that are? Somebody say, I'm going to believe. So you rest, not only that God's going to take care of your problem, but you also start resting in something else. I'm resting in the finished work of the cross. Above all the problems we face in life, one of the biggest ones that challenges us is one day we're going to stand before God. And one day God's going to say, enter, my thou good and faithful servant. Well done. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Or he's going to say, cast him, bind him hand and foot and get him out of my presence right now. There is a heaven and there is a hell. And when I stand before God, I better be trusting in what happened that day on the cross. How many know when you come to thinking about God and whether you're going to heaven or not, you think of if you're ready. But if you believe you become ready because Jesus did all the work in you to make you ready. You don't have to earn heaven. You don't have to... Being good doesn't make us go to heaven, folks. How many know the work of the cross made us ready to go to heaven? Hallelujah. And this is the number one problem with the whole world right now is a lot of them, if they even believe in God, they don't know if they're good enough. They don't understand, and if you've never heard this before, hear it again, hear it for the first time. When you believe he died for you, he earned heaven for you. He makes you 
perfect for heaven in God's sight. And just by the fact that you believed and you're standing on that work to go to heaven, God's going to look at you. You're as righteous as righteous can be. Come on in. Well, God, I didn't do this yet. I didn't even. You can get saved this morning and not have a chance to do one good deed. But if you get saved and you believe the blood of Jesus saves you, you're ready to go to heaven. How many know we're not saved by works? We're saved by the blood of Jesus. Somebody say his death. And you rest in that. And I need to teach this to people that have been serving God for a while because it might still be bothering your heart. I don't know if I'm good enough. Am I a good enough Christian? Stop thinking of what you do or what you don't do. Think about what he did. Because according to the Bible, that's your ticket to heaven, not you earning this thing. Somebody say, I could never be that good to save myself. His power made you all you need to be to enter heaven one day. So rest in that and stop sweating over I'm not good enough or I'm not good enough. Uh, What did they look at when they looked at the giants and the walls? What did they look at after that that made them doubt? They looked at themselves. I'm not a giant. I'm not a wall cracker. How am I going to get in there? How are we going to take this land, Moses? Look at us. We're like grasshoppers compared to them. There's armies of hundreds of thousands. What are we going to do? Joshua and Caleb said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to believe God. God's with us. You need to stop looking at your own abilities and start looking at God's when it comes to how good you are to go to heaven and learn how to rest. Somebody say, enter into that rest. Oh, how many want to enter that rest? For he that has entered into his rest, he ceases from his own works. You stop sweating over trying to make yourself good enough for God. You stop sweating. See, people are sweating. Every religion on earth except Christianity makes you earn heaven. Every religion on earth except Christianity makes you earn it. But Christianity teaches. You see what Jesus did on that cross when he died? That makes you fit to go to heaven if you'll only believe it. Well, this religion says I've got to do this. And I heard one famous boxer, he died a while back, but he, he believed that he, his religion says, I got to do so many good, and he purposely done good causes, spent, gave millions, trying to earn his way to heaven. Somebody say, Jesus paid it all. Wouldn't it be awesome to go to somebody like that and say, look, Jesus paid it all. Yes, you have to be good, but you'll never be good enough to earn heaven. Jesus makes you good. Why don't you try Jesus? It'll make you rest. Praise God. Aren't you glad? And let us labor, therefore. Now, look, listen to this as I get ready to close. Listen to this. Let us labor. To enter into rest? Doesn't that sound like a contradiction? Okay, let's work. Well, in one sense, it's not. When was the Sabbath in the Old Testament? Which day of the week? Numbered day. Seventh. The last day, right? By the way, the Sabbath isn't Sunday. Huh? Come on. How many know what I'm saying? Sabbath's not Sunday. Oh, the Sabbath changed from Saturday to Sunday. No, it didn't. The Sabbath changed from a day to Jesus. Jesus is the Sabbath. We rest in him. I'm resting now. I'm resting tomorrow. I'm going to rest every day because I'm resting in the finished work of the cross. Somebody say, if it's finished, I don't need to add to it. Woo, it's finished. I'm ready. I'm ready to go to heaven. I'm going to explode those gates open, and I'm going to walk on in one day. Hallelujah. So, but the reason it says you labor, and that was the Sabbath was after the work week. You worked, and then you rested. So he says, we've got to labor to enter into this rest. But what he means here is, there's, you've got to, somebody say, take the word and mix it with faith. That's your labor. How many are laboring this morning? Man, I'm laboring to listen to you, brother. This is really different stuff. <laughs> Sometimes that'll be a labor in itself. And then my wife's saying, yeah, you're laboring. Close it down. You preached long enough this morning. <laughs> but I got to get this through to you. I could read her mind. <laughs> I feel the Lord telling me too there. I think you've said enough. <laughs> so I'm kind of wrapping it up right now in my spirit. It's hard to obey the Lord sometimes. I feel like talking more. It feels good to preach. But... I'm taking this word, and I'm mixing it in my heart with faith. How many are laboring? You're laboring this morning? You're mixing the word with faith? I'm believing this. I'm believing this. I'm going to do what that preacher said this week. Some of you, like Leona and Alfie and 
that you're in a problem right now. Mix this word with faith. This is what I needed. This is the, the doctor's giving pills here. They're getting pills for that. Well, I'm getting the gospel right now. <laughs> I'm taking this. And, and so labor to enter into his rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. The same example as what? Israel, when they doubted. Hallelujah, God. Why? Why do we have to labor? What's verse 12 tell us the reason is? For the word. Somebody say the word. The word of God. The thing you have to have faith in. I've just given you the word of God. How many believe this word's powerful? How many believe it's quick? That's King James for life-giving. You feel life this morning? The word is alive. It's powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. You know what that's so good for? Is it, it cuts between spirit and soul. It takes out the unbelief of my soul, separates it from my spirit, and throws it out of my life. It pierces even to, it goes even that far to get into the unbelief that's there and take it out. How many feel some unbelief coming out of your heart now because of the word? If, you, if you've been laboring this morning, if you've been mixing what I'm preaching, and Leona applying it to her situation with her son, Alfie, situation with your wife. Jonathan, with your mother-in-law. And whatever situation any of you are in. Pauline and her niece. And you're applying that word to that situation. And God's taking the unbelief out. That's why you, it's so good to labor by mixing the word. Because that word is powerful. Hallelujah. And he knows the thoughts and intents of our hearts. Don't, aren't you glad he knows the struggle you're going through in your heart? Aren't you glad he sees the pain and he sees the worry and the concern? And he says, I promise you, child, you mix what I just told you with that word. Mix your faith with it. And I will take out that unbelief the more you hear my word. I want to get so full of this word. I'm spiritually muscle bound. <laughs> Hallelujah. So strong from that word of God. Mix it. Believe it. And then you can do what verse 16 says. You can come how? Somebody say boldly. Boldly unto the throne of grace to find help in the time of need. You may obtain mercy to find grace in the, to help in the time of need. And how many remember what that lid of that Ark of the Covenant was called? The mercy seat. How many know that represents the throne of God? Come to find mercy at the throne of grace. That means I'm going into the holiest. I'm crossing Jordan and I'm getting in. Hallelujah, God. How many are entering into where the glory never fails? Let's all stand right now. Let's thank God that he's there. Hallelujah. That there's an answer to our problems. That he will be with us. Father, in the name of Jesus, you see every person here today. Every one of them got struggles. There's no temptation that's not common. It, it's common to all of us. It might not be my day for hardship, but it's somebody else's. I might be going through it, and somebody's not, but they soon will, and there'll be another one come along. There's no discharge in this war. But Father, I thank you, Lord, that we can learn to be content in whatever state we're in. We can enter in when others fail, because we don't have to doubt like they did. I want to believe God, and I believe your word in Jesus' name. So, Lord, and I want everybody to do this right now. Think of something you're going through. Think of a hardship. And if you've never done it before, do it this morning. Put it in God's hands. Lord, I'm casting my care on you because you care for me. I'm casting my care on you. I'm letting, that means I'm not going to worry about it anymore. I'm going to fight unbelief. I'm going to fight doubt this afternoon, after you go home, remember what I just said. Don't worry about it anymore. Whatever you're giving to God right now, he reads your minds. He knows what you're thinking. Don't worry about it. If worry comes and temptation comes, do what I did way back years ago. I'm not going to worry. No, that's out of my mind right now. God is going to make a way. God is going to make a way. How many are pushing? How many are pushing? How many are push praying until something happens? Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, right now we put our burdens in your hands. We ask you to deal with all of our problems. 
Touch Randy right now. Touch Savannah, God. Coralie, Sarah. Lord, touch all of these needs. We put them into your hands. We're not going to worry. We're going to, when temptation comes to get scared, we're going to say, no, sir. God, you're in control. You're taking care of it. Hallelujah. I don't care if you tempt me 10,000 times before I see the miracle. I'm going to cast you away every moment and say, no, God's taking care of it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's thank God right now in Jesus' name.